A will is so essential. I absolutely don't know why people don't write one, even considering that anybody can write a will. Anyone can write their own will. But if you're thinking of tax in relation to the will, you've got to try to write a tax-efficient will. You can inherit property that you had no idea would come to you. So in this case that we've got right now, if I were to write a will, I need to capture it, even though I don't have the document to prove that it's totally mine yet. The whole idea of a trust is that you put your assets into this vehicle. The trust is almost like a company. There are many benefits with using a trust but that does not mean you don't need a will because whatever assets are not in the trust are still going to be your assets and that's a mistake I think many people make but the benefit of a trust is that for example if you're not defined by where you, where you come from yeah. and I think that's a big message that I always yeah. want to tell people like like you have to be able to be uncomfortable yeah. like be comfortable with being uncomfortable When you grow up in ends, you don't realise it when you're confident, but you have an audacity to do things that ordinarily most people wouldn't be willing to do. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Atto. We have a special guest in the building, Deborah, who is a practicing solicitor in England and Wales, a certified EU GDPR practitioner and a certified will writer with over 27 years experience within the legal profession with a focus on data protection. Deborah, how are you doing today? Hello, I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm actually looking forward to this conversation because we've been speaking uh, quite a bit uh, and I'm quite excited because I think it's not really a conversation that we've had before and I think it's it's very vital I think all of us actually um need what we're going to be uh, talking about today um but yeah uh, you know obviously I described you but who who's Deborah well you described me accurately I am a practicing solicitor in England and Wales and I have been in the legal profession for at least 27 years I'm an advanced will writer and I'm also an author okay and we're going to talk a little bit about, I've got your 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 book here, right? Um, how to write a tax efficient will, which we'll, you know, reference. But we like to start the podcast, you know, talking about people's story. Because I think I think that gives life to, you know, the people that come onto the podcast. So, um, so where are your parents from? My parents are from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And I, I was born there as well. I was born on the island of St. Lucia. Okay, nice. And I loved it there. I, I absolutely loved it. It's a beautiful island. And I describe how I grew up as wild and free. <laughs> wild and free. <laughs> okay. Not to be taken in the wrong context, mm. but it's just that I was a I had a really happy childhood. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about about the childhood and well, you know, growing up in Saint Lucia. The thing is, you know, you're used to open space. You spend your days at the beach. You learn to ride bikes, and you learn to ride horses, and you learn to swim in the open sea. And these are not things that I think I would have had if I had been brought up here. Mm. So I loved that aspect of my life. Okay, I like that. I like that. And what part of like St. Lucia did you grow up in? The north, the, the grizzly area of it, the northern the northern part of the mm. island, mm. which is called Gros Islet or Grizzly. Okay. Mm. What's that part like? It's flat. Okay. Compared to the middle of the island, which is very mountainous. Mm -hmm. And it's usually a destination for tourists to do their weddings and that sort of thing. We're known as the wedding capital of the Eastern Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And it's got lots of hotels and good living, to be honest with you. Okay, cool. <laughs> do you go back often to St. Lucia? Not as often as I would like. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I heard it's, uh, it's not as cheap as it, you know, these days it's a bit pricey to go back to St. Lucia. Yes, it used to be quite affordable, but mm. now it's becoming a little less affordable. Uh, but I would say, not that it's less affordable, but if you've got to budget to actually go there now. Okay, it's one of those ones. Gosh, gosh. Okay, so did you end up schooling in St. Lucia as well? Yes, until I was um, 20 years old. Okay, cool. So I did up to my A-levels there. Mm, well, mm. I, no, I finished my A-levels at 19. Okay, um, so I was there up to the age of 19 and mm. I worked there for three years mm. to save some money to come here to study. Okay, cool. Yes. And then law, like how did that 
did, did you knew you wanted to be a lawyer from when you were young? Was Absolutely. That? Okay. I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer from the age of eight. Wow. Okay. Because we used to watch lots of Perry Mason, you know those all those law programs, um, Professor Hart, when when we on over our television. So I knew I just felt this was what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You know, paper chase and all these different programs. And that really formed my formative years. And I'm like, I'm, I want to be a lawyer. I'm going to grow up to be a lawyer. And I kept saying that throughout my life. I have no regrets. I actually love the fact that I was able to achieve that vision, which I had from my childhood. Yeah, that's interesting. This fact, the fact that you wanted to to be a lawyer. And did you have in mind what type of lawyer you were going to be? As At that well? time, I wasn't quite sure because all we really saw was um, the criminal law aspect of it. And I actually worked here as a crown prosecutor for nine Were years. Were you? Okay. Not because necessarily I wanted to become a criminal lawyer, but mm. it was what the opportunity which I got. And I actually became a crown prosecutor and worked here for nine years. Okay. Oh yeah. my gosh, I did not. I did not read that part of your bio. <laughs> wow. Gosh, how did you find that, doing that? Very interesting. But after a while, to me, it was overwhelming mm. because you deal with the negative part of society all day long. But there is also something rewarding about it at the same time because you are defending the rights of persons who have been done a wrong. And so it's kind of a mix, but sometimes when you have to deal with repeatedly negative matters, it, there comes a point when you feel you need to get out. And I think I came to that point in 2012. Okay, okay. So yeah. I got out. I took voluntary redundancy and got out. Okay. I, I can un I can understand that, you know, for, from a... I, I didn't go as far as you in law, but I studied law. And um, I think what kind of made me transition to tech was that reason. I think I was interested in the crime aspect, but I was just like, I don't know if I could deal with the darkness of that yes. all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so then I opted not to to, to do it. So I, I completely understand um, what you're doing. Okay. And then, um, so you, you studied law. So when you came to the UK, right, you said that you ended up studying. What did you, was it a law degree that you ended up doing here? And then, yes. And then obviously. I, I did a law degree here and I also did the bar. Okay. So I am officially a barrister at law. Mm. And after a few years, I converted to become a solicitor. And um, I've been practicing as a solicitor since. The thing is, in the Caribbean, you really need to be a barrister because they practice in all areas and there's lots of court work. Yeah. So you've got to be able to do both. Okay. Here, the profession is more separated. So you need to choose one or the other. Okay, so in 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 Saint Lucia, it was a bit more varied, a bit more. It's not like like you said the separation. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you've got to specialize. Yeah, but there you specialize in everything. Okay, that's interesting. And I kind of like the fact that you've got to specialize here because you can really focus on what you want to become an expert at. Mm. Whereas over there, you've got to do a lot of research to get on top of the topic that is before you mm -hmm. but hey you can you, you are always on top of your topic yeah. because that's the only thing you do or you specialize now you specialize in two or three matters mm. yeah how did you find the transition though from like you know being living growing up and living in you know saint lucia to come to the uk very very good question because i grew up as i said open space lots of open space when I came here, I found it so claustrophobic. I realized that I was claustrophobic. Everywhere was too small for me. You know, when you've been brought up in a home where the doors and the windows lead right to the outside. So you have like the outside, inside, you know, sort of thing. You don't feel enclosed. But here I felt like everything is so closed up. And then there's the underground. We've got to be going beneath the ground. <laughs> <laughs> London underground is, I is know. crazy. <laughs> and that was never uh, something that's, that's not, that doesn't exist in the Caribbean. Mm. So um, I did feel, realize that I was claustrophobic, but I've become used to it now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's what <laughs> you, you got no choice. Yes. You always have to be. So you're currently working as a solicitor at Sefford. Uh, what does that like role entail at the moment for you? 
at Setford Solicitors, there are about 500 lawyers. I'm about just one of them. Mm. But I specialize in data protection law. Data protection has become something that everyone needs to be aware of mm. currently because um, information is key. And people having your information, whether it be people who have acquired it for good purposes or people who have acquired them for but with bad intentions. So data protection has become so key to our lives now. So I help businesses become data protection compliant. And I also help people whose data has been breached mm -hmm. to take legal action. Okay, that's interesting. And in your 27 years as a lawyer, what, what are the key lessons that you've learned? The key lessons of having been a lawyer is that law in, entails everything that we do. Mm -hmm. Everything. You know, you go to buy a newspaper at the local supermarket or you just walk on the street and a car passes too close to you or someone frightens you. It, it involves every aspect of our life. And I think you should always study or work with something that you love. I would say to anybody, don't... don't engage yourself in a profession that you do not love because to me it's not work I love what I do and so it even though the books may look large <laughs> it doesn't bother me because I know what I'm looking for and because I love what I'm doing it it doesn't feel like work yeah so I would encourage people to always ensure that they choose something that they love mm -hmm. I agree. I think I think it's important. And I, I love the fact that you're saying that because, you know, a career, a 27 year career is it's a long career. Right. And um, I think um, sometimes, you know, I've, I've done 10 years in my career, um, but even then I still got a long way to go. And I think sometimes you can become a bit short sighted and just kind of want the quick wins very immediately or you know just do things just purely for money and not that money is not important in your career but I think sometimes when you just do that maybe you can become miserable because you spend so much time at work yes. right you're spending 40 hours a week so I think at least have some you know enjoyment to it um so wills right so how did you get into the business of, you know, writing wills for people? Wills became a passion of mine because of what happened within my own personal family. And um, my parents passed and they did not write a will. They thought to themselves that we'd all get along, we love each other, we would be just wonderful family after they were gone. And we were a lovely family. That's, there's no doubt about that. My happiest moments were with my brothers and sisters, and I still remember them very fondly. And even when we meet, you know, those, those memories and those joys, you know, still come back. But what happened was my father inherited, unknown to him, a substantial amount of property from a relative because he was one of the only surviving relatives that my uncle had or his uncle, he's my granduncle. And because of that, because of him not having a will and having inherited so much property that he did not expect, he literally became a millionaire wow. by becoming part of this person's estate because this person's estate came down to him. So we had a modest estate. We know we had a house, we had a piece of land and ourselves, you know, each other. But with him inheriting so much more from some a third party, he was now classified, could be classified as a millionaire. Okay. And he had made no provision because he did not have a will. We had to go through the challenges of administration, letters of administration. And of course, you need regular family meetings because I've got eight brothers and there are four sisters. So there are 12 of us. Now trying to determine how we're going to manage the estate, who, who is going to be appointed to do what, how the estate is to be divided, um, what to do with the estate. Mm. You know, because before my parents passed, there was only one house and a piece of land, you know, the, the land that the house was on. But now there is much more. And that began to cause confusion with the amongst us so much so that to date there are some family members that may not want to have much to do with me 
you know, because the friction, as some people want this, some people want that, and you disagree with them. Also, the cost of all these things, there is cost involved in appointing administrators, there's, there's cost involved in getting lawyers involved, there's cost involved in doing um, letters of administration when somebody in the line has died to get that person's estate resolved so that you can continue with the administration. Yeah. You know, so it became much more complicated than it needed to be. So I had my, my mind set on studying the law of succession from the time I came here. Okay. Because I, I, I had personal experience of how not having a will could affect a family. Mm -hmm. So I studied the law of succession as part of my degree. And after that, I did um, a step certifi certified course in advanced will writing. Now, STEP is the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners here in the UK. Yeah. I studied their program so that I could write wills for people at an advanced level. Mm -hmm. And the advanced level is all about learning how to manage tax, inheritance tax, within will writing. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. And um, which we'll talk, you know, a little bit more about, especially you know, with Will, because we, we obviously don't want a similar situation um, to happen. You know, apologies for, you know, that situation happened to you, my condolences. I hope you don't mind me asking, how did, did that situation ever get resolved? Is there a resolution to it from your perspective? There is resolution mm. to it, but it could have taken one or two days or a week to be resolved mm. or even six months if there had been a will. Yeah. But so far it has taken us almost 40 years and it's not final. 40 years? 40 years. Oh and God. it's still not final, final. It's still with the, with the lawyers and no one actually has a piece of paper to show what their share or inheritance is. And it's 40 years. So how is the property being maintained? And um... Well, the property is, we've tried to allocate it to different people. Okay. So some have taken land, some have been given house, but it has taken us 40 years to get to that. And it's still not final because no one has the paper in their hand to show mm. that this share is yours or that share is yeah. yours. Yeah, so you couldn't put that in your will, for example. They couldn't put that in their will or anything. Oh, they can say. still put it in their will, but mm. not as specific as that because okay. that would come to them anyway. Yeah, And that's and it's very interesting that you've made that um, observation. Mm -hmm. Because that's a mistake that some many people make. Mm. You don't have to, and that's a mistake my father made. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have the property in existence at the time for you to inherit it. You can inherit property that was that you had no idea would come to you. So in this case that we've got right now, if I were to write a will, I need to capture it even though I don't have the document to prove that it's totally mine yet. Okay. This is property that I'm entitled to, whether I'm dead or alive. Mm. <laughs> so at whatever point in the journey that it becomes mine, yeah. my will should be able to capture it. That's the importance mm -hmm. of having a will mm -hmm. because it's still in the pipework. So I don't have a document to prove that it's mine. But it's it's in the process. Yeah. So if I were to pass now and I had a will to say, well, my heir will be my daughter or my son or my cousin, it would pass to them if I had a will to say that. Yeah. But if I didn't have a will to say that, it becomes part of the intestacy and you've got to go through less of administration and spend some more money on lawyers. Okay. You understand? And you explain those terms <laughs> after. Cause yes. Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. No, no, I'm so it's fine. Sorry, no, no, yes. no, no, no. I appreciate, like, you know, this is why I'm excited to talk to you about it because uh, it's so much information. I know that you, you're going to be able to share information, but obviously we always want to make sure that the listeners and watchers, even me, I need to understand it too. <laughs> so that I can also relay it, right? Uh, but yeah, no, okay. Uh, it's, a sh it's a shame that it's taken 40, 40 years. And, 40 years. You know, that's that that is a shame. You know, mm -hmm. even six months is, it seems like a long time, but compared to 40 years, it's not, it's not that, yeah. it's not that bad, right? Okay. We don't, obviously, this is why I also appreciate you coming on the podcast because, you know, you have a passion for it and you also don't want people to go through that either. And watchers, listeners, look, I understand we, nobody wants to talk about 
these what if situations. But you know the way I, I like to think about it, and um, I think it was somebody's book that was listened to or or reading. At the end of the day, right? I know that we don't want to talk about you know passing and things like that. I know nobody wants to think about that, but I would. I think it makes sense for people to think more about wouldn't you rather you know your family friends and stuff like that for them to be in a headspace where everything's kind of certain for them rather yes. than uncertain i think that's how you have to kind of think about it in that way wouldn't you it's just a would you rather game right and i would think i would rather people to just understand you know specifics um so okay cool so let's talk let's talk about inheritance tax right because um you know <laughs> There's a saying, obviously, two things are guaranteed, you know, passing and 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 taxes, right? And um, one of those is inheritance tax. Um, mm-hmm. So what exactly is inheritance tax? I think we we hear about that a lot, but what is what is that? Inheritance tax is a tax that has been placed on your assets, the value of your assets, when you are no longer here. And just as you pay income tax, you pay income tax throughout your life. When you're no longer here, the state looks at the value of your assets and will charge 40% of that as tax based on the value of your estate. Mm. So there is a threshold like for inheritance tax is £325,000 worth of assets. So think about your home. Think about any stocks, shares you may have, you know, anything that's going to investments you may have, the value of that, including your car, your business, whatever it is, these things are calculated and inheritance tax is determined as to whether or not you owe or do not owe. But the threshold before you begin to pay anything for anyone is three hundred and twenty-five thousand pounds. Yeah, and they tax you above that. Anything above 000. that three hundred and twenty-five, yeah. but it's all based on your circumstances. Okay, which we'll talk about because obviously, if he wants to pay forty <laughs> percent, wait, it's forty percent. You said right, forty yeah, percent. Yeah, that's a lot. Forty percent. It is a lot. A lot of money. So okay, let's yeah. say that's a lot of money. So let's say what. Let's say somebody's tax, whatever it is, what's the threshold? 20%, 40%, 45% currently, right? Right now. If you're listening in 2027, in 2024, this is the current rates, right? Yeah. So you're taxed that. And then if you if you pass, they're saying, what, we're going to tax you again? Yes, oh they take gosh. account of the value of your assets, your, <sighs> your net worth. And if you pass the threshold, yeah, then you'll be charged a further 40% of okay. that. That's a lot. But they do take into account certain circumstances mm-hmm. if you may have, which may allow you certain other allowances mm-hmm. so that you can get like a discount, so to speak. Okay. What are those allowances, would you say? Like, so, yes. Your, your circumstances would be whether, whether or not you were a single person, were you a married person? Were you a person with a house? Did you do you want to pass that house on to a child or children that you may have? Mm. You know, so all these different situations are taken. Are you a person in, who is divorced? You know, so when you think of writing your will, you've got I've, as a will writer, I've got to think about your personal circumstances. Mm. Are you making a gifts to charities in the will? That might give you a discount, a ten percent discount as well. Okay. So when a will, writing a will is not just like you just write anything. Anybody can write a will. Anyone can write their own will. But if you're thinking of tax in relation to the will, you've got to try to write a tax-efficient will so that when you speak with your will writer, the will writer takes into account, is it possible that you could be charged a 40% tax when all the value of your assets has been taken into account? Or is this a case where you will not meet that threshold? Mm. So the will writer needs to consider, are you going to just be giving away money to the government? Or tell say to you, okay, you may need to speak with a tax advisor mm-hmm. who might be able to assist you <laughs> with reducing the level of tax that you can pay. Yeah, okay, okay. That's, that's, that's interesting, okay. 
So let's talk about a bit about some of those situations. And I think we'll also um, talk about that in in terms of wills as well, a little bit later on, because that's something that you, you cover in your book. So someone who is married versus not married, how does that, what's that impact okay. in terms of inheritance tax? Yes, that's a very good question because yeah. it will also help the people who are just living together and not married. Mm -hmm. Marriage is given a special status. Now we know that the definition has changed. It can be man and man, woman and woman, you know, or it's opposite sex. So that is covered, yeah? Once you are considered married. But with marriage, if you transfer your assets from one partner to the next and one passes, there is 0% inheritance tax. Now that's a big saving. So if I had a partner that I, and we decided to write our wills, we would write mutual wills. He would pass all his assets to me I would pass all my assets to him. And that means that the partner who remains alive has a bigger share of the wealth, all the wealth for themselves. And there is 0% inheritance tax. Okay. That's if you're married. If you are married. Okay. What's if you're, is there any status where you can't be married, but you can adopt those benefits as well? No. Okay. <laughs> so get married people <laughs> not That's, for the wrong yeah, reasons not for, for the, the right wrong reasons, reasons but because for the right there are right some implications reasons. with marriage yes. as well that we'll talk about because there are implications of married you know marriage the, that's a positive but there's if it doesn't work out and you're not careful. Yes, well, you can lose quite a lot in the settlements. Yes, that and also yes. post as well. Yeah, but these are things that you need to con you need to think about. Um, and they're all very important. Your will writer might not be able to assist you with all of those, but the will writer, for example, can assist you if you are divorced and advise you as to what your your position is as far okay. as inheritance tax is concerned. Mm. So if you are divorced, for example, you become like a single person again, but you might want to protect the children that you had in that relationship you see, or you might want to protect the family home that you had for those children because you brought a new partner in, but you don't want the, the new partner to be put out on the streets. Yeah. So it's important to do things like create a life interest trust for, or life interest for that partner, mm. but ensure that at the end of that life interest, then the children will inherit that home. Okay. So there are things that you can do because now the world is so dynamic and families are merged and dynamic mm. and variable. The type of families we knew when we were growing up are not quite the same. I, I always knew two parents, but now we have divorced families. We have families that are merged children from different families, you know, coming in. Um, from different eras of different wives people have had or different husbands yeah. they've had. And people need to think carefully about protecting their assets mm -hmm. as well. Nobody wants someone to run away with their assets. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking of writing a will, you've got to think of all th these scenarios so that you can give the best advice possible. Yeah, okay. That You said something, interest, trust something, trust interest. What was that? No, a life, you have to give a life interest. Yeah. A life interest to the partner. Yeah. So, for example, the best way to describe that is I was married and I had a child with my partner. I then got divorced and I married another partner. Mm -hmm. So, that new partner is coming to live with me or I go to live with him. Well, I have to put it, he has to come to live with me because we're living in the same house. Okay. Now, when, when I die, I don't want my child or children to kick the partner out of the house. Right, okay. So in the will, I give my partner a life interest in the house so that when he, the, my child only gets the house when he dies. Okay. Now, a life interest does not have to be for the whole of the person's life. It could be for a number of years. 
Because sometimes a person just needs like five years to sort themselves out or 10 years to sort themselves out. So you can give them an interest for a number of years, yeah. enabling them to sort themselves out so that your children now can inherit the property. Okay, that's interesting. I, I, I Thank you for that explanation. I did not have an understanding of that at all. Yeah. This is why we need to have these conversations. This is, yeah, this is interesting stuff. Okay, so let's go a little bit deep into a will. At a high level, what is a will and why does everyone need a will? I would describe a will as an expression of your desires when you are no longer here. I mean, the assets are yours and you express your desires to how you would like to see them distributed yeah. when you are not here. You may have loved some people and despised others. So you certainly don't want your assets going to those that you have despised. You prefer them to go to those with whom you've had great connection and great memories, created great memories. Mm -hmm. It can be almost like a, a thank you for having been such a wonderful person or having made my life meaningful. But it can be sad when people who have had no close relationship with you end up inheriting all the assets of the deceased. Okay. But that is life. Yeah. And without a will, there is some stuff that will happen, right? If you yes. don't have a will, there there is. What what kind of happens if you don't have a will? If you don't have a will, the intestacy provisions come into play. Intestacy. Mm. The laws of intestacy. And they may distribute your assets as they see fit. You know, because the, the rules are stipulated and they will they, they do not go it's the government distributing your assets for you they give it to who they think should get it so your partner may have for example only 300 and 250000 pounds that might be all that might be given to your partner and a half interest in the rest of the estate mm -hmm. whereas if you had passed and made a will and given the um done a mutual will and given your partner all of your estates your partner won't have to be fighting with kids who want their share of the estate, you know, and try to force a sale. Yeah. You know, so there are ways to protect yourself and each other, those you love, by writing a will. Or they could have split it in a, in whatever way they wanted, right? And it's clear on, sorry, on the will, right? It's quite clear, okay, yes. you get 150,000, you get 50, yes. you get 50, whatever it is. Exactly. It's quite clear yes. there. Rather than you having to guess what you think the person wished for. Well, it's it's not necessarily a guess because mm. the law has just set it out that mm. way. The, the wife will only get some, the children will get some. Mm. The you know, and they don't leave anyone out. Okay. If you had a child who never paid attention to you all their life, mm. and when because you didn't have a will, they will get a share. You can't stop that. If you have a will, however. You can put in place provisions that this person is not going to get and you can write a letter of wishes to explain why this person is getting nothing. You may have a child that's already a multimillionaire and doesn't need your assets and you want to benefit one child who is still struggling. If you don't have a will, the assets will simply be divided how, the, how it has been stipulated in the law and the child who is a multimillionaire and doesn't need the assets will still get their share. Yeah. Whereas you could have benefited the child who is still struggling. Mm -hmm. So a will has so many, it's so essential. I absolutely don't know why people don't write one. Even considering that anyone can write a will. And I think people need to understand that. Yeah. You may not have written a tax efficient will based on your circumstances. But once you follow the laws of how to sign your will and how to have it witnessed, you can write up on a piece of paper and just get it properly witnessed and it's your will. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. Okay, cool. So when you get a will created, everyone that is named um, in the will plays a role. What are the main roles and what are the, their responsibilities? Uh, That's a very good question. Lots of people don't seem to know the roles that people play in the will. There is yourself who is writing the will. You are called the testator because we like to use very big words or the testatrix, which is a woman and testator is a man. But these days, these words have become interchangeable. You can use testator even though you're talking about a woman. And then there is the executor who is the person who 
brings your assets together. He gets to find out, he or she gets to find out what your assets are, identifies them and gathers them together. And then there is the trustee. Once the assets have been gathered together and have been probated, which is the process of registering that you are dead, your assets now need to be vested in someone else and that the assets get vested in the trustee. Now, the executor and the trustee can be the same person. But sometimes people prefer to have one person as executor and another person as trustee. The executor must be, and I always say that to people, the executor must be someone who can take responsibility. Do not have a procrastinator. <laughs> okay. This work will never get done. Mm. And somebody you feel you can trust and rely on, you know? So it must be someone who is used to responsibilities and who takes their responsibilities seriously. Yeah. Not your friend you used to drink down the pub with who doesn't seem to know the left hand from his right hand. You know, just like an accountant, a solicitor, somebody or a close friend who who knows how to take charge and be responsible. Mm. Can you make a company an executor or somebody at a company, like a professional company? Like, I don't know, someone, like a lawyer someone or at like a company. Yes. So okay. they can say the partners of, mm. but you've got to try to keep it a bit open. So because the person at the company can pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So nice you can thing. say the partners of that company, mm. you know, because companies can continue. The company hasn't got a, it's an artificial person. So it has to be a role or a person at that company. Yeah. The, the partners of John Lewis, the partners of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. And another question I had was the roles that we just mentioned, do those, do people only play those roles? Once someone has unfortunately passed, is that when those roles or are people playing these kind of roles beforehand? No, yeah. a will is about sorting things out when the person has passed. Okay. And okay. that's a, it's a very good question, you mm. know, because that's a mistake I see lots of people make. They keep saying to me, like, they can't, will they take my assets when I put their names in my wills? I'm like, no, <laughs> your, your property is yours. Mm. You have to be no longer here for anyone to do anything um, as an executor or trustee. Yeah. Your property is yours. You can change your will anytime. A will is not written in stone. It's a living document. For example, when I made, wrote the first copy of my book, there was the step provisions for wills, you know, the step standard provisions. It yeah. was only the second edition. Since then, it's the third edition now. They've changed it and it has been updated. So people whose wills are based on the second edition may want to update for executors and trustees, could update to the third edition. Your circumstances could have changed. You decide you're no longer, you've fallen out of your cousin that you gave half of the estate because you all were buddies. Mm. <laughs> and now you don't want to see him. Yeah. You change the will. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's a living document. Mm. And people are advised to have a look at their will at least every five years. Okay. Consider whether or not they want to change it, update it. You know, or, or consider whether or not it's still relevant. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the more I'm having this conversation with you, the more I re it's dawned on me how important this will is. And again, I think we avoid having this conversation because we don't want to think about that aspect. But I think again, if I think if you think about it unemotionally, and you just think about again that for again for me personally. Do you want people to have a good understanding of what should happen next or not? That's how you should kind of treat it and just yes. get over and done with, you know. Um, but it's, it is interesting that you can have people in various roles, you know, from companies and stuff like that. Because I think that gets you to be a bit more serious about, about it. If you're yes. not if you're not so sure about maybe, you know, somebody in your in your circle or maybe you want somebody independent out of your family and your your yes. friends for example as well um so can you provide some examples of like how a will can make you a bit more tax efficient where it reduces like your inheritance tax bill yeah surely surely um let's say you are worth you're a single person because i have to i have to restrict it because it will not apply to everybody 
let's say you are a single person and your value or your net worth is about, I'm making it really simple, 500,000. Yeah. You will only be entitled to 325,000 pounds as an allowance after you pass. So everything above that is going to be a tax at 40%. Mm -hmm. So if you're a single person, you can downsize your assets to make sure you are within the threshold. So if you want to give gifts during your lifetime to someone else, for example, there's the seven-year rule and you pass seven years later, there is zero tax on it. Mm. So that's how you have already written a tax-efficient will whilst benefiting people who are in your circle before you've passed. Mm -hmm. It could be it could be your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, you know. It could be someone you've enabled to start a new business. But you can downsize mm. so that you fit right within your threshold without putting yourself to any detriment. Mm. So how, how, in that case, how do you downsize? Is that you're right? Is there something specific that you're writing in your will to do that? Or? No, you actually take action. Okay. Because that's how you write a tax efficient will, not mm. by writing it in your will, mm. by you understanding how the law applies to you mm -hmm. and then taking action to ensure okay. that when you are no longer here, you are within a threshold right, that okay. does not attract 40% inheritance okay, tax. Okay, okay, I think I understand. Okay, so yes. it's like with the will in mind, you know, mm -hmm. if you pass on your will that somebody's going to be subjected to the 40% tax because your property value is 500,000, your net worth is 500,000. So because you know that, you... You can take done. action. So yeah. if you think you are going to pass at a very high threshold... Mm -hmm you can then downsize to fit just into your threshold without making your life uncomfortable mm. so that you are, the, your value of your estate is now within your threshold. Okay. And so you can either be at 0% tax or they'll take whatever left at a much, not at, even though it's still 40%, it will be a much, a smaller amount that they've got to take 40% out of. Okay, okay. I, I like that. Are there any other tax efficient things that you can do to lower your tax bill at the time of someone's passing that you can think of? Yes. Um, you know, sometimes I have heard people say, oh, they changed your will after he died. That is possible. That is possible. You can, if the beneficiaries come together, they have up to two years and they can change the will after the person has died to enable it to be more tax efficient. And the probate lawyers will deal with that on their behalf, mm -hmm. you know, because but there must be agreement between all the beneficiaries. For example, if you have an asset that might cause the tax to be very high, we can move the asset to another person. Okay. But it has to be done with consent okay. of the beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there are things that can be done, but that is a matter for probate lawyers. Okay. I focus on the will itself. Okay, okay. So, okay, so there are potential. But, okay, in the will itself, are there any ways that you know of? Because I think you mentioned one, which was giving assets to each other. So that yes, was one where zero percent. that's married people. At Is there any other similar situation like with children or things like that? Yes, well, they make good provisions for children as well and where you have a house. Mm. So if you are single and you have a child and you have a house, you get an additional allowance of 175000 if you have a house. Okay. Now, we know that houses are more than 175000 I don't know where you're getting one at that price. Yeah. <laughs> but if you are single with a child and you have a house, your allowance now goes up, goes up to half a million, 500000 So you can pass down to your child by passing the house to your child and your allowance, half a million to your child mm -hmm. before you get taxed at the 40%. Okay. Great, great. And uh, what I really like, you know, is that you, you outline a lot of these kind of scenarios um, in the book, which I appreciate you. You go through each one uh, and you've got characters in there, which kind of describes it. So you, obviously you talk about if a person's single, if a person's like married, if they have children. I think it's, it makes it quite easier for you to understand like how you can kind of do this yourself. 
Um, so I was, I was thinking, right, as so I was, I was reading a little bit about this, right. I think again, when people are probably listening and watching the, this, they're thinking, so if I'm named on the will, am I going to be, because I think when you see in the newspaper, you, you see, oh, this person's been hit with an inheritance tax bill. But I, what I was reading was that actually, although there are people who are going to benefit from it, they're not the ones who actually pay the tax bill is my understanding. Okay. That is partially correct okay. because it is true that the executors need to sort things out. But the tax bill, when they've paid it, what are you going to inherit? Where are <laughs> okay. they taking the money from? Okay. You understand? Okay. So, so there's less to... for you. Yeah. So the less inheritance tax the executors have to pay, the more money for you or the yeah. more, you know, assets for you. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> so don't get caught with that one. Yeah, yeah. Because the executors are never going to push their hands in their pocket to take any money out on your behalf. Yeah. Anything that is being paid for comes from the estate. Yeah. But they handle their estate, right? They yeah. handle it. Yeah, but you got to make but, sure that they Yes, but yeah. if you there was 40,000 there that you could have gotten and the bill is 40,000, that's 40,000 less that you don't yeah, get. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay, so let's talk about some horror stories that you're aware of in situations where, you know, people haven't had wills or they may not have drafted them correctly or, yeah. you know, things like that. Well, one of the things that happens sometimes is that, you know, when the will writer writes the will, they send it off to you with instructions to sign the will and get it witnessed properly. They may also send you instructions for a storage mm. units where you can store your will. There are will writing storage units, you know, so that you your will is kept in a safe place. Mm -hmm. And some people haven't signed the will. They've simply sent it off to the storage unit. Gosh. And that means you don't have a will. That is, <laughs> that is... So, okay, so if you don't sign it, you don't have it. You don't have it. If oh. you don't sign it properly, you don't have a will. Oh, my God. Your assets get dealt with on intestacy, as mm. an intestacy, you know? That's not it's great, It's terrible, is it? not great at all. Oh so even gosh. though you've taken all that effort, because you did not go through the instructions, the signing instructions mm -hmm. properly and gotten it signed by two witnesses you know, seeing you at the same time signing it and signing that they have witnessed you sign it, you you don't have a will. And then you send it off to the storage unit thinking you've got a will. Man. Yeah. And you don't. And then you pass and when the will is retrieved. Mm -hmm. It was never signed. Yeah. Actually, I just realized that you've answered the question that I wanted to ask you can, in terms of can people write wills for other people? And it sounds like yes, if you sign it. Is that definitely not. No, definitely not. Okay, explain. I'm that not to me. quite sure what you mean by can people write I'm, wills I'm, I'm for thinking, other people? I'm thinking, but definitely. I'm thinking not. like in terms of um and we're gonna get to it a little bit later. Let's say somebody's ill, for example, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but they do want a will mm -hmm. written for them. Can somebody do it on their behalf is the question I'm asking. No, I need to be very careful with yeah. that question. Okay. Because you'll end up in jail. <laughs> <laughs> why? Who's ended up I in jail? I will tell you why. Okay. I will tell you okay. why. I'll tell you why. Okay. Because if someone is ill, it's all about capacity, mental capacity. Okay. 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 Right? Now, if the person has mental capacity, they can give instructions to write their own will. Okay. Right. Okay. If they do not have mental capacity, then you need to face the court of protection who will appoint someone to assist them or to write a will on their behalf. Right, okay. But it's not just anybody. Mm. We need the court of protection here. Okay. You know, because sometimes people call me up, oh, my family's in a, in a home, he's got dementia, and can you write a will? I'm like, excuse me, I don't think so. He needs an assessment before I can even consider writing a will for yeah. him, a proper assessment to determine whether or not he or she has mental capacity. Mm. Because I'm not going to go to jail for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we and definitely you will don't have want to, to send people to jail. <laughs> yeah, and you will have to pay for that mental assessment. Yeah. You know, so I've got to cover my back. Yeah, that's you know, fair. But, but people wait <laughs> too long and too late. Mm. 
you know, and then they've got some person who can't remember if the day is Monday or Tuesday, who the prime minister is, if they're standing or sleeping, lying or waking. It, it happens to all of us. We all get old and this can happen. Dementia can set in. Mm. But sometimes it can be so bad that there is no way you cannot take any instructions from this person. They don't yeah. even know what they're doing. Okay. So mental capacity is key mm, Okay. before you ride wheels for people. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you know what? I'm glad that we're having this conversation because not only, see, this can happen, right? Oh, like, yes. If we're talking about health. The thing is, the reason why I'm saying that is because I feel like sometimes maybe people can't be, won't be as proactive. And when they want to be proactive is when somebody's getting ill. And that's like, okay, late. let's come and do that now. It's too that's late. why I wanted to ask about that kind of situation, you know? Okay. Cool. But the court of protection can help. <laughs> okay. Court of protection yes. can help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, zoom in, and I'm assuming that everybody watching, listening, if you don't have a will, they're going to want to, you know, get their will created. What are, what are the steps that someone can take today to get a will created for them, especially when we're thinking about, you know, being more tax efficient? Well, I don't want to promote my own self, mm. but they can certainly contact me. I also have a book online on Amazon, How to Write a Tax-Efficient Will. They can also order that book. Now, the reason why I would highly recommend the book as well is because it all happened during COVID. I started getting calls. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you help me? Can you help me? Can you? And I'm like, how do I get people to understand that they can write tax-efficient wills without it being complicated? And how can I write the wills out for them so they can see exactly what they can write yeah. to make their wills um, tax efficient based on their circumstances? So this is why the book is actually divided into whether you are single, single with children, single with no children, married, married with children, divorced, whether yeah. you own a home, whether you are, you know, and what happens if you are intestate. I also cover things like um, lasting powers of attorney in the book, you know, and I put in the step provision so they can see what powers an executor can have mm -hmm. and how the executor needs to manage their affairs, you know, but that's how it started because I was like, people need to understand what they need to do. Mm -hmm. And there was no way of reaching out to them physically. So I thought, you know what, I'll sit in here and I'm going to write a book and I'm going to put it on Amazon <laughs> And they can literally see what's in there. Once they, and I'm, I'm, I'm writing it in such simple language that a 10-year-old could read it mm -hmm. and understand. I'm trying to make a story of it mm -hmm. so that it's engaging. Yeah. And Or even though you wish to just go to your section because for your circumstances you will understand exactly what you need to do. Yeah. And then, okay, let's assume they do get the book, right? Which is is a great book. I do recommend people getting it, especially if you do want to, because it sounds like the two options are, obviously, if you do write it yourself, it's better for you to educate yourself on it, which the book will help yes. you with, because obviously it's written by a lawyer, or you pay somebody to to, to write it for yes, you, right? It, Those yeah, are the yeah. two options. It sounds yes. like you, you have, obviously, the third option, not recommend writing it yourself which may mean that if you do write it yourself, you might miss out on... You might, but yeah. I'm saying that you can because yeah. I, I don't want people to believe that they must engage a lawyer yeah. to write their will for mm. them or they must engage a will writer. They can write it themselves, but they must follow the formalities and the book makes that quite clear. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes, look, for peace of mind, you have to pay for peace of mind. For look, peace of mind. And it's not, not everybody much. Can, not everything can be free. Because yeah. even free, right? The, the word free. The truth is nothing's actually ever free. Mm -hmm. Because if you're spending, if you spend two, three hours on something, that's not free. Mm -hmm. You spent your time on it. Yes, you did. Your, your time costs. So it's not free. Nothing's mm -hmm. free. So I think people think it's free. I'm not spending my heart. But you're spending your time. Yes. Which is more valuable, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Um, okay. And if. Let's say people did want to go down the route of, you know, they didn't want to write it themselves because I think some people are just comfortable engaging. Yes. Um, you know, legal professional. How much? What's the typical cost for, you know, on average for 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 will writing? Okay, so you're not asking for my specific cost. Just generally. <laughs> just generally. Yeah. Now, generally, it's a general cost. A, yeah. a big. A, it could be any figure. Mm. 
Some people charge a thousand pounds. Some people charge fourteen ninety nine. I don't know what type of wheel they give for that. Um, so it's a it's a good range. Um, it, it usually tends to be when a solicitor writes a will, you'll pay a bit more. Okay. I I write my wills as a will writer because mm -hmm. I'm really interested in helping people just write a tax efficient will. Just uh, examine their scenarios and give them advice as to how they might be able to make the will more tax efficient by thinking about certain things. Yeah. And some people, you know, their assets are so large. Um, people who have assets over 2.5 million, they really need to go and speak with a tax advisor. I don't, you know, I don't, I, and I don't, I, I, the book is not about giving people techniques to avoid tax. It's not about that. It's about helping people think about what they need to think about when writing their will so that they can consider all the tax implications of their decisions. Yeah. But the benefit of the book is that it provides examples right then. I'm writing the wills out, all of them out, after every scenario, so that people can see what the options are. Mm. And some people have told me they've just picked up the book, read it, and written their will, and they're happy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's fine. But if you want me to write it for you, I'm available mm. as well. So okay. it's all very interesting. I think it helped a lot of the pe people during the COVID season. Yeah. When yeah. um, they, you couldn't leave your house to be with other people, mm -hmm. you had to be at home. Yeah, that definitely was probably fears of, of that, yes. right? I think it probably spiked up at that time. And then you, you did mention um, updating, looking at updating your will every five years. Is there any other times that people should be thinking about updating their wills? Definitely all the time. As I say, it's a living document. Mm -hmm. Five years is okay. just a framework. But you can update it every year because you may become a may have won the lottery mm -hmm. in a day. So if, if yesterday you wrote your will and you won the lottery the next day, you've got to think about how you wish to update your will. Yeah. Um, if your circumstances change, because I, I don't only cover the wills, I also cover lasting powers of attorney. Mm -hmm. You need to think about your circumstances so that you can consider, okay... What do I need? Do I need to update my will? Do I need to have a lasting power of attorney? And th those those sorts of things. So you need to think in the round. Yeah, A will is not something you just write and put it down and that's the end of that. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. It's something that you need to keep reviewing, keep in mind um, as your circumstances change. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. And let's talk a little bit about trust, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is also mentioned in the book from what I remember. Yes, yeah, I do yeah. briefly discuss trust in mm -hmm. the book. Um, but I'm trying to get people to think about that option yeah, and how it might assist them in protecting their assets. Mm -hmm. Because the whole idea of a trust is that you put your assets into this vehicle. It's the, the trust is almost like a company. And the assets now don't do no longer belong to you. They belong to this vehicle or this company. And you can call the company anything, the Bowers Trust or the Aton Trust, mm. you know, and you put all your assets in there. There are many benefits with using a trust, but that does not mean you don't need a will. Yeah. Because whatever assets are not in the trust are still going to be your assets. Okay. Okay. And that's a mistake I think many people make. Mm -hmm. But the benefit of a trust is that, for example, if you have a daughter that you think she might marry a rogue, but you want her to have the benefit of your assets, but you don't want her rogue partner, druggy, to, <laughs> oh <my> <laughs> <laughs> to get his hands on it, you put yeah. all your assets in a trust to protect her. You make her beneficiary under your trust. And the benefit, because she's only a beneficiary under the trust, it's a discretionary trust. You appoint people as the trustees. You make her a beneficiary under discretionary trust. It is their decision when and how they give her money mm. or anything at all. Okay. So the partner doesn't get to touch it. Mm. So you can protect people, like in a if you have your assets in a trust. Yeah. But any assets which fall outside the trust, mm -hmm. you, your will needs to catch that. Yeah. You know? You can also use a trust to protect a disabled child because the, with the assets in the trust will provide for that child whilst you are not here. 
people also use trust to protect them themselves against care home fees. And you've got to do it early enough whilst you are still mentally sound because it is not guaranteed because the the government can decide that it can be challenged if if people if they realize that you're simply doing this to avoid paying care home fees and leaving your care to the state. But if you've de- done this many years in advance, it is possible if the trust has been running for a number of years that those assets will not be used to t- um, take care of your care home fees. Okay. So there, there are many, many benefits to trust. Yeah. And people should consider them as well mm-hmm. at the point when they write in their wills. Okay. And in the will, this is a complicated question, but I love me some complicated questions, mm-hmm. right? In the will, can you, <clears throat> can you, because it sounds like a trust, you need to set that up whilst you're alive and that needs to be running whilst you're alive. So does that mean then in your will, you can't write into the will, oh, I set up a trust Blah 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 oh, blah. <laughs> Look I, at me. I see. No, it's, it's, yeah. no, it's my mistake. It's yeah. my mistake because there are two different types of trusts. Okay, 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 great. What great. the one we just spoke about mm. are living trusts. Okay, cool. You do it whilst you are alive. Yeah. For example, whilst you are alive right now, you can take all your assets and put into a trust and make mm-hmm. yourself a beneficiary mm-hmm. under that trust. Yeah. And your um, executors, you can even make yourself one of the executors. Of the trust, you know, wow. you know, so and you will make your decisions at exercising that power in your own interest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these are living trusts. These are trusts while you're alive and well. You you have no issues, and many wealthy people have those kinds of trusts. Okay. Yeah, their assets are in the millions or trillions. Their family has that type of trust. Okay. So there are. Those who administer the trust on their behalf and dish out what they believe is relevant to the different beneficiaries under the trust as and when they see necessary. Because the beneficiaries sometimes have to make an application for support, you know, put their petition to the executors, the administrators of the trust, and the administrators will then decide whether or not they help them. And in these families... This could be families of millions, billions of, of, of pounds and large estates. The, ch- the children have been, uh, would make an application or what they, what they do to the executors of the trust to, or the trustees to, 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 to assist them in one way or the other. It could be in setting up a business. It could be a monthly amount that they need. Mm-hmm. But those are very wealthy families. I, I don't come across those very often that's just my knowledge okay i help people who are average within zero to two million more more likely than not <laughs> zero to two million average two million average <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> and um <laughs> well that's what my insurance covers okay the other people need to speak with professional advisors mm. you know tax advisors and people who know much more than myself mm. um but I don't do any of these Im- important calculations and shifting of assets. I'm not qualified for that. Mm-hmm. I'm simply, I write, I help people write their wills mm. so that they can think about the tax implications. And when, if someone of that caliber was to come to me, I would, I could still write their will, but I need to point them to financial advisors and tax advisors. Okay. Because those people have the strategies to assist them with the the volume of asset, the volume of wealth that they have. Yeah. So they need strategies. They don't need to just write a will. They need strategies to avoid the tax, okay. so to speak. Okay. Yes. That makes sense. And then you said that's a living trust. Yes, that would be a living trust. And then the other trust is... A... The other type of trust is the one you can write in your will. Okay. So you can decide at the point of your passing that you want all your assets to be placed into a trust. Okay. And your executors will do that for you and you can appoint to the people that you want in your in your trust, the same people to take take care of it and to distribute your assets to your beneficiaries under a discretionary trust the same way, mm-hmm. but that's only after you are gone. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's okay, that's so that's interesting to know. So you can do 
both ways. Okay, yes. cool. No, Deborah, it's been it's been great to uh, speak to you today. Um, so obviously, we talked about the book and you know what's in it, and you know the motivation around uh, writing it. Um, where can people get a copy of it if they want to? you know get a copy of the book yes that the, it's, the book is available on amazon.co.uk i make amazon.co.uk my market because the book is targeted at uk citizens and inheritance tax in the uk mm-hmm. i do cover a bit of scotland as well as what their inheritance tax provisions for scotland are and the intestacy provisions for scotland because they're different from England. But someone has criticized me in the last reviews that I had yeah, for I not that. covering Ireland. Yeah, I saw that. I, and, I'm glad that you're speaking and, about and it. And so I have put into the book where they can get the provisions. In this third edition, I have put into the book where they can get the provisions for Ireland. Because I, it never even crossed my mind. They thought I had been very malicious. <laughs> the person who wrote the review thought I had been very malicious in leaving Ireland out. But it hadn't crossed my mind. But this time, I, for the Irish people, I have placed in the book where they can get the provisions for, to write a will considering the tax implications in Ireland. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know what? So I hope they forgive me for that. I mean, first <laughs> of all, you know, appreciate you. And, you know, uh, con- uh, let me add, I'm not even going to say congratulations, but I appreciate that you actually looked at that feedback yes. and you responded to it. Some people wouldn't do anything. So the per- <laughs> to the person, I don't know if they if they're listening to this. Yes. You know, Deborah actually looked at the feedback. I saw that. I saw that feedback yes. as well. Um, personally, from my point of view, I, I, I think that I I understand where they're coming from, but I think that I think sometimes that could be quite harsh because you know, yes, call it out, but to there was so much good content in the book. I think yeah. that people sometimes they try and find the one yes. wrongness and then try and make the overall with, oh, you know. Yeah, but, that, that's, yeah. but you know, so. feedback is feedback. Feedback like, the, the, feedback. The, the, someone yeah. else looked at the book and thought to themselves, like, I bought this book because I wanted many strategies on how to avoid tax. Yeah, I saw that one as well. And, <laughs> and, and that was why the book was written. They're not written for that caliber of person. That yeah. caliber of person needs a financial advisor mm-hmm. and a tax advisor. The book is written for people who have not even thought through about how there is a 40% inheritance tax that's waiting for them if they don't sort their affairs out. And I'm quite sure that that person who bought the book for the strategies is fully aware that that tax is 40%. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I'm writing for the person who is thinking to themselves, they don't that, who doesn't is not aware that that 40% tax exists. Mm-hmm. To save them that 40% tax and to help their families keep more for themselves. Yes. Yeah. You know, so and the person who who has so many assets that they're looking for strategies really needs to speak with a tax planner or a financial advisor, mm-hmm. as well as a will writer. <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> they need three people. You need three people. You need your team. And That's we talked, right. We've spoken about team. teams on the yes. podcast before as well. Mm. I appreciate you, Deborah. Thank you so much for sharing so much great information with us uh, today. Where can people find you? Obviously, if they want to connect with you, reach out to you. Well, I've got a website, deborahbarberswillwriting.com. I've also got a YouTube channel where I've got some very little funny videos there. Um, that teaches people how to write a tax efficient will. It's at Deborah Bowers on YouTube. Um, they can also phone me. They have my details in the book, and and on the website you can contact me by just booking a fifteen minute free session with me on the website. Okay. As well. Um, but yeah, they can feel free to call me, contact me, and I'm more than happy to assist. Amazing, amazing! Thank you so much, Deborah. Like, is it's uh, it's always again. I know people don't always, you know, these kind of conversations. They can be a little bit like, oh, but we have to have it at the end of the day, we right? Some there's some it. things that need to happen, and um, yeah, we just got to think about setting these things up for us. And thank you so much for sharing your journey and sharing like you know very valuable information with us. Um, do you have any final words for the watchers and listeners? I want to tell people that writing a will is not tempting fate. I know especially in the Afro-Caribbean community, 
We tend to think that writing a will is tempting fate, but writing a will is more about protecting your assets for the next generation, building that family wealth, making your family stronger. You know, and I would really encourage them not only to write wills, but to also put in place lasting powers of attorney. You know, our community doesn't think of these things as well. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you so much, watchers and listeners, for tuning in to this episode of the podcast. And we'll see you next week's episode. Bye.